I wish to distinguish between science and pseudoscience. In this episode of Philosophers Explained by me, Stephen Hicks, we turn to Karl Popper's 1962 Conjectures and Refutations, in which the eminent philosopher of science takes up precisely that question. What is science? Why is astronomy a science but astrology not? Why is Einstein's theory a science but, more controversially, perhaps not those of Marx or Freud? Let's go to the text. This is the opening chapter of Karl Popper's uh, book, 1962, Science, Conjectures, and Refutations. And he uh, signals his key question in the opening paragraph. So let's read. I decided to give you a report of my own work in the philosophy of science since the autumn of 1919. So basically a 43-year survey. When I first began to grapple with the problem, when should a theory be ranked as scientific? Or is there a criterion for the scientific character or status of a theory? So what, what is science? Now I want to backtrack to the title, the, uh, the strong title here, and uh, Popper gives us some hints to how he's going to answer that question in the title. So what is science? Well, conjectures and refutations. And it's interesting right off the bat because often when we think about science, we think of science as something firm, as something established, uh, theories and hypotheses that have a high degree of probability rather, or, or even certainty. And so Popper is indicating that no, it's conjectures, right? And conjectures are something that are more speculative, a little more wild, a little more uh, uncertain, shall we say. We also, when we think about science, often think about things that have been well established by confirmations or corroborations, overwhelming amounts of experimental data. So we're emphasizing the positive that leads to the positive status of those scientific beliefs. And here Popper is emphasizing a negative concept, refutations, not so much confirmation. So uh, perhaps a different understanding of what the nature of, of science is. So uh, sometimes when we think about this issue of what is science, and we think about all of the various things that people do, uh, uh, what well, we say, you know, they, uh, they do religion, they do politics, they do family, they play sports, and so forth. So what is it that we are picking out when we are saying this is science, say, in distinction to uh, for all of those other uh, activities that are that are going on. And then we might say, well, science is, uh, uh, and then we start to give a list of beliefs that we think are scientific beliefs or scientific knowledge. So uh, force equals mass times acceleration, E equals MC squared, DNA is a double helix structure. And so we have a whole list of beliefs or propositions or networks of those that are theories, uh, uh, that are laws, etc. And the science then is this body of knowledge that has been worked out across the generations. Now, another approach might be to say, no, science is not so much the bodies of knowledge or the beliefs or the principles or the laws, but rather the method by which those are arrived at. So it's not a content first and foremost, it is a method, an empirical method, say, an experimental method of using logic and math and so forth. And so these things might result from science, but the science itself is this set of methods that we are that we are that we are using. Or we might say, well, uh, you know, any uh, uh, method can be done mechanically uh, by rote. You know, I can be a high school kid in the lab, you know, doing the experiment that my chemistry teacher has assigned to me. But I'm not really being scientific, even though I'm doing an experiment. I'm just going through the motions. I'm just doing what the what the, the teacher told me to do. And we also know that any resulting theory, uh, I might uh, you know parrot after my chemistry teacher Avogadro's number. Uh, and, and knows how to figure out what a mole means, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's simply that I am parroting or, or, or accepting as a dogma because my teacher told me so, it's not also scientific. So we might, not say, we might then say that science is not so much a set of beliefs or a set of principles or, or a set of doctrines or even the methods by which they are arrived, but perhaps how those are done or how those are held. 
And if it's a matter of dogmatism or just faith or just uh, just blind belief, then that's not really scientific. So science might then be an attitude or a disposition, uh, how I'm using my mind with respect to those methods and those doctrines. So all of this territory, Karl Popper is, uh, is interested in setting himself to. Now going to the second paragraph now, the problem which troubled me at the time was neither when is a theory true, nor when is a theory acceptable? My problem was different. I wish to distinguish between science and pseudoscience. Right, so something can be scientific then without necessarily being acceptable, or something can be scientific without necessarily being true. And he goes on to explain why. I knew, of course, the most widely accepted answer to my problem, that science is distinguished from pseudoscience or from metaphysics by its empirical method, which is essentially inductive, proceeding from observation or experiment. So let's take this, uh, as he calls it, the most widely accepted answer. And often that's code for saying, this is the answer that I'm going to reject or, or, or find problematic in, in some ways. So uh, what if we then say uh, the contrast between science and others and what we're here calling metaphysics is that metaphysics is this kind of speculative, sometimes otherworldly, not really grounded in uh, experience or, or, or empirical data. Uh, and that science then is the opposite of that because precisely it is grounded in this, this empirical method. Or we might say <clears throat> that there's a difference between using your mind to start with very general propositions, which one accepts as true, and try to deduce various things from those and, and find things that fit into that pre-existing set of general principles that one has accepted. And the contrast then would be to say that what makes something science is that it doesn't start at the top, it starts at the bottom, so to speak. It starts with particular observations, particular d data results, and works its way up more broadly to uh, generalizations and and so forth. So that's a commonly held answer to this question. Uh, but this did not satisfy me. So why not? And this is striking. I, on the contrary, I often formulated my problem as one of distinguishing between a genuinely empirical method and a non-empirical or even pseudo-empirical method. So then he goes on to give the example of astrology. So we might say astrology is scientific because it is uh, incorporates a lot of empirical stuff. After all, it involves <clears throat> the heavens, it involves the planets, the moon, the sun, and lots of observations about the relative position of them and what their movements are. And then all of that is then integrated with a general theory about you know, your character or your destiny is determined by the status of, uh, of, of the stars, the sun and the moon, and, and so forth. So there's lots of empirical stuff that is in astrology, but Popper then uh, is indicating well, that's not the right kind of empirical stuff, or not the right way to integrate empirical stuff into the theory, because astrology still is pseudo-scientific. So what would then be a genuinely empirical method instead of a pseudo uh, uh, empirical method. Now, jumping down a little bit, he uses now a positive example. Uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, and Popper is going to take this as a gold standard, a uh, clear example of something that is scientific, and then uh, try to contrast that to say things like astrology, what differs from them, even though they are somewhat large, big picture cosmological uh, accounts of the way the world works. And then more provocatively, right off the bat, uh, 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 Popper goes on to mention by name Marx, Freud, and Adler, Karl Marx's uh, uh, philosophical theory and his uh, political economic theory about communist revolutions and the march of history, very popular in the early part of the 20th century. The same could be said of Freud's psychological theory and then Alfred Adler's uh, individual psychology theory. And what's interesting about all of these is not only that they had captured the minds of so many intellectuals in the early part of the 20th century, but that they also build themselves as scientific theories. These are not merely speculative 
uh, uh, psychological theories or, or, or philosophical theories in some old-fashioned metaphysical sense. And so uh, Popper then wants to suggest, and this is going to get everyone's attention, <laughs> that perhaps Marx, Freud, and Adler are in the same category as alchemy and astrology, and that genuine science uh, like Einstein's and various others are to be distinguished in some fundamental way. So how might we get there. Now, let's take the positive example first, relativity and uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Of course, he says there was a lot of popular nonsense talked about these theories and especially about relativity, but I was fortunate in those who introduced me to the study of this theory. We all, the small circle of students to which I belong, were thrilled with the result of uh, Eddington's eclipse observations, which in 1919 brought the first important confirmation of Einstein's theory of gravitation. So the idea uh, in part uh, 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 is to say that Einstein's theory of relativity did predict that light was subject to gravitational forces. The problem is that the effect is so slight that it requires large masses and large distances in order to be able to put it to any sort of experimental test. And here on Earth with uh, 19th century, early 20th century uh, instruments, uh, uh, the distances are, 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 are not great enough and the, uh, the, uh, the tools that we devise don't seem to be subtle enough to be able to detect them. So the idea here is that there is an eclipse, uh, that we knew there was a sun, or sorry, a star way far out and its light was going to pass close to the sun, uh, and then on its way it would come to Earth and then we would be able to detect the uh, light from this distant star once it reached the Earth. And the idea here is that the sun is a large mass object and so if Einstein's theory of gravitational uh, it, it, gravity rather is correct, it should affect the path of the light and that path of the light would be detectable. So we have a large enough mass to exert a gravitational force, the sun, and we have the proper distances or the great distances involved and maybe we can, we can, we can do so. And the point here is that Einstein predicted a certain effect and ahead of time and then Eddington's observations confirmed that effect. So this is science, this is good science, and it's interesting also that uh, Popper here uses the language of confirmation. He's going to have some strong reservations about confirmation language a little bit later. So here we have then a scientific theory. We have some empirical uh, uh, data as a result of, a, of an experiment that was done, and uh, uh, on the basis of that we can say this is a good example of science. But at the same time, Popper says, while I'm uh, uh, you know, thrilled and, and, and deeply involved in thinking about Einsteinian relativity and so forth, I'm also engaged with Marxism and Freudianism, as, uh, as most intellectuals are, and I have my doubts when I start to uh, investigate these other theories. The Marxist theory of history, psychoanalysis, that's Freud's, and individual psychology, that's Adler's, I began to feel dubious about their claims to scientific status. Well, why? Well, I began to feel that these other three theories, though posing as science, had in fact more in common with primitives, primitive myths than with science, that they resembled astrology rather than astronomy. Well, why so? Uh, and then he goes on to say, well, Look at the people who are admirers and advocates of these theories. I found that those of my friends who were admirers of Marx, Freud, and Adler were impressed by a number of points common to these theories and especially to their apparent explanatory power. So explanatory power is italicized by Popper in the, in the original. So what do we mean by explanatory power? These theories appear to be able to explain practically everything that happened within the fields to which they referred. 
So why is this a problem, though? Because that's precisely what we want scientific theories to be uh, able to do, right? If it's a true theory or if it's a good theory, it will be able to explain all of the data. If it can't explain the data or not very much of it, then that's the sign of a weak theory. So the idea here is if we take Marxist theory, we take Freudian theory, we can explain this, that, and the other thing, and look at all the things that we can explain. Uh, therefore, I am impressed by them as a scientific theory and isn't a mark of science to be looking for explanations for things, not just accepting them, oh, that's just the, the way the fates uh, go, that's just the way stuff happens, that's just God's will, and you don't take the questioning any further. You look for a causal explanation. The study of any of them seemed to have the effect of an intellectual conversion or revelation. Okay, so now Popper is up in the language conversion and revelation. Those are words that come out of the religion uh, 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 cognitive uh, approach, not so much the scientific approach. Uh, so he's suggesting that uh, perhaps the psychology at work is different here, despite the explanatory power. Open your eyes to a new truth hidden from those not yet initiated. So perhaps part of it is a, 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 a social element. You want to be one of the initiate. You want to be in the club. Uh, so it's not just individual psychology. It's a certain measure of social psychology that may also be at work here. Once your eyes were thus opened, you saw confirmed instances everywhere. The world was full of verifications of the theory. Whatever happened always confirmed it. Thus its truth appeared manifest, and unbelievers were clearly people who did not want to see the manifest truth, who refused to see it. These are bad people, parenthetically, either because it was against their class interest or because their repressions, which were still unanalyzed and crying aloud for treatment. So we have this kind of religious psychology or language or, 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 or a kind of move that seems better captured by a religious psychological language than psychological or science psychological language, an element of a social component. One wants to be part of the initiate. You're not really thinking things through for yourself. And then also this habit uh, in the face of disagreement that one quickly then gets to ad hominem uh, argument or attacking people. Uh, uh, in various ways for not sharing what you and the other initiates believe to be true. The most characteristic element of this situation seemed to me the incessant stream of confirmations of observations which verified the theories in question. So it's an overemphasis on confirmation, on verification, on, so to speak, the positive side of, uh, of, uh, of epistemology. A Marxist could not open a newspaper without finding on every page confirming evidence for his interpretation of history. The Freudian analysts emphasized that their theories were constantly verified by their clinical observations. All right, so let's take this language then of confirmation and observation and verification, Popper then is, uh, is asking us to do, and unpack that a little further. <clears throat> so. We have a new confirmation that we think comes along. Well, what I asked myself, did it confirm? No more than that a case could be interpreted in light of a theory. But this meant very little, I reflected, since every conceivable case could be interpreted in the light of Adler's theory or equally of Freud's. I may illustrate this by two very different examples of human behavior. That of a man who pushes a child into the water with the intention of drowning it. That of a man who sacrifices his life in an attempt to save the child. All right, so here's our two examples. We are trying scientifically to, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to explain them. All right, and so this happens and this happens. So we have our empirical facts. And now as scientists, we want to explain these two facts. Why did this man drown the child or intend to drown the child? Why did this man save the child? And then we appeal to our theory, which of course, uh, its great virtue is that it is to provide an explanation for these human behaviors. So according to Freud, the first man suffered from repression, while the second man had achieved sublimation. 
According to Adler, the first man suffered from feelings of inferiority, perhaps the need to prove himself that he dared to commit some crime. And so did the second man, whose need was to prove himself that he dared to rescue the crime. So let's take the Adler case. And then what we say is human behavior is explained primarily or exclusively or significantly by the inferiority complex. And so we all have this inferiority complex and we act in ways to alleviate our inferiority complex. So therefore, no matter what we do, we're going to say it's explained by the inferiority complex. So why did I try to drown this child? Well, it's because I have an inferiority complex. In this case, I, uh, I want to show that I'm manly enough or daring enough or, or, or uh, enough of a rogue to be able to do so. So if I try to drown this child, then that alleviates my inferiority complex. But then the completely opposite kind of behavior, I uh, saved a child. Why did I save that child? Well, anybody who saves a child also uh, is engaging in an act of physical daring, a kind of courage, and that also is going to alleviate my inferiority complex. I will be able to feel good about myself. I'm a manly, daring, courageous man. So no matter what I do, my inferiority complex is the explanation. So what kind of explanation is this, though, if it counts for absolutely everything? So Popper carries on here. I if I'm inside the Adlerian frame or inside the Marxist frame or inside the Freudian frame, could not think of any human behavior which could not be interpreted in terms of either theory. It was precisely this fact that they always fitted, that they were always confirmed, which in the eyes of their admirers constituted the strongest argument in favor of these theories. I'm pausing here. So from the perspective of the believer of the theory, the fact that it can explain everything is seen as a virtue, and Popper then wants to turn that the other way around. It began to dawn on me that this apparent strength was, in fact, their weakness. And again, the contrast is going to be to Einstein's theory and his willingness to put it to the test. With Einstein's theory, the situation was strikingly different. Einstein's prediction, just then confirmed by the findings of Eddington's expedition. And the impressive thing in the next paragraph, after he goes on to explain the fit between the theory and the proposed experimental evidence, the impressive thing about this case is the risk involved in a prediction of this kind. If observation shows that the predicted effect is definitely absent, that is to say, the light from the distant star if it had not bent a certain way as it passed by the sun, that then would disconfirm Einstein's theory. And Einstein ahead of time was recognizing that and, so to speak, putting the theory on the line. If observation shows that the predicted effect is definitely absent, then the theory is simply refuted. The theory is incompatible with certain possible results of observations. In fact, with results which everybody before Einstein would have expected. So Einstein has a theory, and yes, he wants to be able to explain physical phenomena, in this case, gravitational effects. Right? But ahead of time, the theory is not simply going out looking for confirmations of the theory. It's also looking for possible refutations of the theory. Experiments such that if the experiment goes this way, that would refute the theory. And if it goes this way, it would confirm the theory. And this is different, Mar uh, sorry, Popper is saying, with respect to Marx and Freud, Adler, astrologists, and the other. This is quite different from the situation I have previously described when it turned out that the theories in question were compatible with the most divergent behavior. So it was practically impossible to describe any human behavior that might not be claimed to be a verification of these theories. So Einstein is willing to put his theory to the test and can identify ahead of time uh, experimental results that if they turn out to be factual right, or true, verified, would refute his theory. And the mindset then of someone who is not an Einsteinian scientist, right, or a scientist at all, is that they are not doing that, they're not willing to do that, or they cannot imagine 
a kind of experimental outcome that would refute their theory. This is significant for Popper. So these considerations led me in the winter of 1919 to 1920 to conclusions which I may now reformulate as follows. So what we are interested in, this question of what really is science, and Popper then is going to give a seven-part then breakdown of what makes science science. Okay. It is easy to obtain confirmations or verifications for nearly every theory if we look for confirmation. So here we have an early expression of what we call confirmation bias. Uh, one has a certain idea, a certain belief, and one then goes out looking for things that will confirm that theory or provide positive support for it. And Popper's point is you can always do that. That's pretty easy, but it is a trap. So science uh, should not be that easy is one indication here. But confirmations should count only if they are the result of risky predictions. That is to say that one is make, taking your theory, deriving predictions about what should be happening in the world, and they shouldn't be easy predictions. They should be hard predictions. You're looking for things that uh, put the theory at risk, that it might turn out to be false if the facts turn out to be a certain way. So the mark of a scientist then is this dispositional set, this willingness to put the theory at risk. And then unscientific people or anti-scientific theory by implication are going to be people who have their beliefs and they are protective of their beliefs. They never put their beliefs at risk. They aren't willing to put it to the risky prediction test. Number three, Every good, and I just put this in quotation marks, this is an evaluative concept, every good scientific theory is a prohibition. It forbids certain things to happen. The more a theory forbids, the better it is. So here, emphasizing the negative right, rather than the positive, rather than saying, I can explain this, I can explain this, I can explain this. Uh, uh, what we are looking for is this is not possible. This cannot happen. And uh, attention to what the scientific theory is explicitly prohibiting, because then, of course, that gives us things to start looking for. If those things do, in fact, happen, then our theory is in trouble. But that's what we want if we have the right mindset. A theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. So that then is to say a good test of one's own thinking is then to say, look, I've got my theory. Uh, if I cannot imagine, I cannot conceive of a possible event that would refute my theory, then my theory, whatever it is, it's not a scientific theory. And then in a social context, right, one good test then uh, to figure out, are you engaging with someone on scientific grounds, someone who's actually committed to doing the scientific work? And you ask that person, what fact or possible fact can you imagine occurring that would undermine your position? And if the person cannot do that and is unwilling to try to engage in that exercise, then that tells you about their non-scientific status. Every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify it. So we want to say, yes, we have theories, we have empirical data, we have experiments that we are engaging in, but that can't just be road or can't just be going through the motions. It can't be too easy. Uh, if we are going to do an experiment, if it is a scientific experiment, interestingly, the scientific experiment will be an attempt to refute the theory. You're not just looking for another confirmation. You're trying to disprove or falsify the theory. Six, confirming evidence should not count except when it is the result of a genuine test of the theory. So one has gone through this falsification exercise. And here, Karl Popper indicates a change in terminology because the language of confirmation has such a long history in logic, in scientific method, and so forth, that he thinks it has a bit too much baggage, that it builds too much into it. So he wants to uh, substitute now a, uh, a slightly weaker concept, that, uh, not, not in the sense that it's, less, that it's less clear, but in the sense that it's not claiming so 
much. And so positive instances that, er, uh, that emerge from genuine attempts to test a theory, we will, not, we will not call them confirmations, we will call them corroborations, and that's uh, Papirian language here. Number seven, and finally, some genuinely testable theories, when found to be false, are still upheld by their admirers. For example, by introducing ad hoc some auxiliary assumption. Uh, ad hoc is kind of uh, at, at this or after the fact or at this point here, we just add something or other. So I have a theory, the re predicted re uh, result was going to be this, we ran the experiment, but I did not get this result. And so rather than saying denying the consequent or modus tollens, therefore my theory or hypothesis is refuted, instead what the person will do is some, add some other governing conditions or, or, or other claims about the nature of the theory. Uh, and then still believe in the theory. And then if it happens again, I'll add some more ad hoc assumptions over here until I end up with this very cumbersome theory. And at some point, Popper then wants to say, it should be clear this person is not genuinely willing to put their theory to the test. They're just going to keep on adding ad hoc assumptions in order to protect the theory. And there's a price here. Of course, there is a place sometimes for ad hoc theories. We don't expect all of our theories and hypotheses to be exactly correct the first time out, but there is a serious judgment call. Going down that road, as Popper puts it here, is to say it rescues the theory from refutation only at the price of destroying or at least lowering its scientific status. So, in conclusion then, what is the distinction between science and pseudoscience? Here is Karl Popper's then proposal. The criterion of the scientific status of a theory is its falsifiability or refutability or testability. End of section. Now, this is uh, the first section in a very long introductory chapter in Conjectures and Reputations. It has 10 or 11 parts to it. Uh, I'm going to stop here, except by uh, I want to introduce a couple of quick suggestions about uh, 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 Popper's discussion of the logic of falsifiability as we work it out and his fuller working out of scientific methodologies, reworking them in the light of the falsifiability criterion. And here he hearkens back to the two earlier modern philosophers whose epistemological work was governing much of what had been done in philosophy epistemologically and in scientific method since then. So in section four of this uh, opening chapter, he turns to David Hume and Hume's rejection of the, uh, the, uh, the principle of induction. And what Popper wants to indicate here is that Hume was partly right and also partly wrong in his account of induction, and then Popper needs to respond to that as he as he goes on to do. So we have an episode on David Hume's treatise of human nature in this Philosopher's Explained series. So what I would recommend is uh, if you're going to read further in Popper's essay, become familiar with Hume on induction. Uh, the, perhaps the Philosopher's Explained episode we've done will be helpful there. But here's the point in brief. Hume, I felt, was perfectly right in pointing out that induction cannot lo be logically justified. So there is no positive way on Hume's account from starting from particular instances logically to get to generalization. So induction comes to be a myth, and Hume is known as a skeptic with respect to induction. Popper thinks that Hume is logically correct. And so that's partly why he wants to switch away from positive confirmations uh, to this principle of negative falsifiability. I found Hume's refutation of inductive inference clear and conclusive, but I felt completely dissatisfied with his psychological explanation of induction in terms of customs or habits. So either what we need to do is have a different psychological theory or emphasize a different approach to the logic in order to respond to Hume's skeptical 
result. Now, a similar point about Immanuel Kant in the generation after David Hume. Uh, uh, what Popper wants to indicate is that in some respects, uh, Kant was correct, but in other respects, Kant is wrong. We also have an episode in this Philosopher's Explained series on Kant's uh, foundational critique of pure reason and precisely this issue. So again, uh, uh, be, uh, be sure before reading further in the Popper selection to go back and get up to speed on what the Kantian theory is. Kant's reply to Hume, this is Popper now, came near to being right for the distinction between an a priori valid expectation and one which is both genetically and logically prior to observation, but not a priori valid, is really somewhat subtle. So what Kant wants to argue is that we are not purely empirical. Nature does not, so to speak, impress upon our minds uh, facts or truths about the way that it is. Instead, our minds have certain uh, inbuilt structures that are prior to, hence a priori to our experience. And what they do is filter and construct a reality that we then come to be aware of. So uh, this is Kant's attempt to answer Hume's skepticism, but it does introduce some other serious problems of its own. And Popper's uh, uh, our position is that Kant proved too much. Carrying on, when Kant said, our intellect does not draw its laws from nature, but imposes its laws upon nature, he was right. So pausing there for a moment, rather than saying that the laws are drawn from the objects, right, or that the laws have a status of being objective because nature is the way it is and our intellect simply draws from nature these scientific laws. Rather, the subjective approach, that in the subject, so to speak, there are these a priori structures, and that what we do, is, or our intellect, is we impose those subjective structures on nature. So Popper is saying that Kant is right about that. But in thinking that these laws are necessarily true, or that we necessarily succeed in imposing them upon nature, he was wrong. Again, pausing here just for an interjection. The suggestion here is if Kant is correct and we have uh, these inbuilt structures that filter and structure everything that comes in from reality, then it should not be possible for us to make a mistake or to get everything right. We would only ever see things the way our subjective structures want us to see various things. So how would we ever make a mistake? And Popper is pointing out that precisely we do often make mistakes and we are aware that we are making mistakes. Picking up the quotation again, nature very often resists quite successfully, forcing us to discard our laws as refuted. But if we live, we may try again. So the idea here is that we do have these a priori structures, but they're not completely successful in imposing their will, so to speak, on nature. Nature resists, right, so to speak. So that then is to say that what we can do is uh, internally recognize that somehow our structures might be leading us astray and then try something different. Uh, 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 and so there's more flexibility that has to be built into the system somehow. Now with that, Science then is a commitment to falsification, not an easy looking for confirmations.